As we consider Riemann sums of the form that we have expressed here, where we're computing a total area of n rectangles underneath a particular curve f of x, given by this expression, what we'll want here is a shorthand notation for everything that you see on the screen, because this is a lot of notation and it's a lot to look at. So in order to simplify that notation, we are going to define a new notation that I have over here on the left-hand side that means the same thing as what we have on the right-hand side. However, we're going to talk about the thing on the left-hand side a little bit differently. It's also important to remember just how much is crammed in to this shorthand notation because every little piece of what's occurring on the left is important. So let's walk through it and discuss each piece of this notation along with what it means and what it's called. So first of all, this thing we have on the left-hand side that's decomposed down below is called a definite integral. The integral sign is this thing right here that looks like an S. And it's meant to look like an S because what we're doing is a summation. So in the way that we have a Greek letter S over here in our sigma notation, our integral has this S sign over here, which corresponds to that idea that we're summing something. Now it's called a definite integral because it has numbers that will appear at the bottom and the top of that integral sign. These numbers are sometimes called the bounds of integration, or as you can see here, they're limits of integration. So those letters A and B, which are coming from the endpoints of our interval, are called either the limits of integration or the bounds of integration, and it's having those numbers present that makes this a definite integral. We will, in the future, see examples of an integral sign where there are no numbers on the top and the bottom, and such an integral is called an indefinite integral. Now this stuff right here that's occurring to the right of the integral sign is often called the integrand, and the pieces that we're seeing in the integrand right here are corresponding to the addends that we have up here in our Riemann sum, where one of the things that we're looking at corresponds to the width of a rectangle, and one of the things corresponds to the height of a rectangle. So the easiest thing here to match up is that I have an f of x right here, where I have an f of a sub k right here. This piece is talking about the height of a rectangle. And this dx right here, this d is for difference in x values. While up here we found the width of our rectangles by taking the whole length of our interval and subdividing it into n pieces of equal size, that's where this b minus a over n came from, we could have alternatively looked at the endpoints of one of the subintervals, which would have been some sort of a sub k, and then either one higher or lower than that, like an a sub k minus 1. We could have found the width of that rectangle by taking the difference of those two a k values, which would have been a difference in x's. So this dx that is occurring right here is representing the width of our rectangle, and it's also telling us the variable of integration. Now all of this stuff all together would be pronounced out loud as the integral of f from a to b, or alternatively the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Upon assigning a numerical value to this integral, either as we did before in the Riemann sum video, or through other methods that we'll see in the future, we're said to have evaluated the integral. So all of this is the terminology that we have that goes along with just this small bit of notation right here. So in summary, that integral sign that looks like an S is an S for sum. An integral is always representing a sum of individual areas. In the context we've presented this, our definite integrals are a representation of total signed area. 
Now we're thinking of them as representing area. The reason I have the word sine here is that we are using values of f of x for the height of our rectangles. And in all of the examples we've seen thus far, I've used f of x values that were above the x-axis. However, there's no universal rule that functions need to always be above the x-axis. It's quite reasonable for a function to take on values that are below the x-axis. And if I were to use a negative value here for f of x, then I could get a negative area just from a computation of a positive number multiplied by a negative number. While we don't generally think of negative numbers as being something that could occur with area, that's why we've indicated that when we're computing these definite integrals, we're looking at signed area, assigning positive values to things that are above the x-axis and negative values to things that are below the x-axis. So it will be possible when looking at definite integrals, even though they represent area, to get a negative value. And what that means is that we've got some values that are occurring below the x-axis. When looking at the integrand, it's important to remember that the dx has a value and a meaning. It doesn't just tell us the variable of integration, but it truly represents the width of the rectangle, and the f of x is representing the height. So both pieces, the f of x and the dx, are important when looking at a definite integral. And last but not least, we can think of this a as something of a starting value, and this b as something of a stopping value. And this integral is telling us to add up all the little areas from a to b. And we should note that this is also a signed thing. We've used examples where our a values are smaller than our b values, but there's nothing that really forces us to do that. And if we were to have a values that were larger than our b values, we need to think through what that does to the value of the integral, and it's something that we'll see later in these videos. So I'd like to end this video with an example where we're asked to compute a definite integral from 0 to 4 of the function square root of 16 minus x squared plus 3. And although they're not written here, you can insert some parentheses here and here around that function square root of 16 minus x squared plus 3 before being multiplied by the dx. This whole piece right here is our f of x being multiplied by our dx. Now in order to compute the value of this definite integral, we could work out a Riemann sum, as we did in the first videos. We could work out that sum, express it as a function of n, and then take the limit as n goes to infinity of that particular sum. However, that was a really difficult process, and it's not always possible to come up with a closed form for the Riemann sums we get in the first part of those problems. Here, what I would always recommend is drawing a picture, because every time we see a definite integral, we should be thinking about notions of area. When I go ahead and draw a picture of the function defined by the integrand, I see that what I'm getting looks like a quarter circle sitting on top of a rectangle. In fact, that is what I'm getting. If you think about the function y is equal to the square root of 16 minus x squared, just this part right here, that's really defining a circle centered at the origin of radius the square root of 16, which is 4. Then adding this 3 to the function shifts the center of the circle away from the origin to the point 0, 3. So right here at the point 0, 3, I can think of the center of a circle and this quarter of a circle that's being defined here is coming out of this equation. So I truly have a quarter of a circle sitting on top of a rectangle, and what this definite integral is asking me to compute is this shaded area. I can do that using basic formulas of geometry, and if I've found the area, I've found the area. I don't have to find it through computing a Riemann sum. Applying that to this problem, if I look at my quarter circle first, a quarter of a circle of radius 4 has area 4 pi. If I then take a look at this rectangle here, which has a base of length 4 and a height of 3, that has an area of 12. 
So altogether, my total area that's shaded in this picture is given by 12 plus 4 pi, and that's the final answer we should associate with this definite integral.